All right, we are officially at 350. I think we're going to get started. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. This is going to be a fun session. We have 90 minutes. Now, um, let's, uh, let's do this. So first of all, I'll introduce myself. My name is Dan Garfield. I am uh, the co-founder and chief open source officer of a wonderful company called CodeFresh. Um, I'm an Argo maintainer. I've been working on Argo for maybe five years now. Um, uh, we've, uh, we launched a commercial version of Argo from CodeFresh about four years, three and a half years ago. Um, we helped bring Argo into the CNCF and then to, uh, sponsored it as a project and helped it get into incubation and then into graduation finally. So we've been doing this for a long time. We've helped. I don't know, countless companies adopt Argo and GitOps and these best practices. Um, and uh, uh, joining me today are two amazing people um, who will raise their hands. We've got Costas Capilonis, who's right here, and next to him is Laurent uh, Rochette. And uh, Laurent is an um, experienced solutions architect and helps people adopt this stuff uh, all day long and debug and all those kinds of things. And then Costas is actually the author of the training that we're going to be doing today. And if you don't follow him, um, he does a lot of blog posts and trainings and things. He, he gave a talk earlier today that was very good about doing GitOps with databases. But uh, with all of that preamble, let me ask you a question. How many of you have done the CodeFresh GitOps certification? Perfect. Okay, so this is actually really good. So if you didn't know this, it is the most popular GitOps certification in the world and the fastest growing. We have over 20,000 students who have done the certification. All of you, because you are here, are going to get free access to the entire certification, even though we're only going to be doing a portion of it today. Um, how many of people have deployed an app using Argo before? Perfect. Okay. So we're, cause we're not really going to cover that too much in depth. If you haven't figured that out now, as we go through, feel free to raise your hand. If you get stuck on anything, Costas and Laurent are going to be roaming around. And if you get stuck on something, something's not working, something's not making sense, uh, feel free, um, to jump in. And then we're also a small enough group that if you have questions, shout them out, they've got microphones, we can run around and we can, we can have the conversation and figure it out. Does that sound good? All right, awesome. Um, we also have, for all of you, don't leave without this, but for everybody who's doing the certification, do, we brought you a free Argo tumbler. So uh, put hot beverages in it or cold ones. I'm not the boss of you. Look, I'm not saying, look, you do you, okay? You put popcorn in there if you want. It's not my business. All right, so to get started, um, we have a code that's set up for you that's codefresh-ftw, all uppercase. This is going to give you free access to the entire certification. We're going to be working, like I said, on a subsection of it. So I'm going to show you how to do this in a second, but it's learning.codefresh.io. That's the code. Um, I'll leave it up there for another 30 seconds. I'm going to demonstrate how to redeem it, and then I'll put it back on the screen. So it's going to go away, but it's going to come back. It's coming back. It's going away. It's coming back. If you don't redeem this today, it's going to expire. So if, uh, if your plan is to take a picture and dart out of the room, you have to redeem the code, then you can dart out of the room. All right. So um, if I go to learning.codefresh.io, um, it's going to have this certification here. And the easiest way to do this is if you scroll down and you see these two courses, keep going till you get to the bundle, click review bundle and buy now, and then put in, you won't need to put in a credit card or anything, put in the code fresh dash FTW, click redeem, and it will show $0 cost. Okay. All right. So I'm going to put that back on the screen. Uh, so you can all get that completed. Um, now today we're going to be working on promotion with GitOps, and uh, there are a lot of, gosh, tricks to this and ins and outs of it. Like I said, we have 90 minutes. If you do the entire certification, if you just, if you're like, hey man, this is, I feel like I don't have the basis of what you're talking about. 
feel free to just go start at the beginning of the certification, put on your headphones and ignore me. Um, but what we're going to do is we have some presentation where we explain the principles and then all of the certifications come with labs. So in your, on your computer, in your browser, you're going to be able to run these labs. It runs remotely. Um, hopefully the internet's okay. Uh, we just spun up like 50 VM. Actually, we spun up 150 VMs, come to think of it. So um, you shouldn't have very much wait time as we do these labs. Um, and then the other thing is when you sign up for the GitOps certification, you'll get an invite. It's in the very first section of the certification to a Discord called GitOps Champions. And you, chosen few, can join and become a GitOps champion and join that Discord. And so even after today, even in a week or in a month, you can pop into GitOps uh, champion certification and ask questions and get ideas. And there's a lot of other like-minded folks who are doing GitOps with Argo. Now, it's possible to do Argo CD and not do GitOps. Um, a lot of people do that, actually. It's very common for people to deploy applications uh, using Argo CD and never set up those applications in Git. And so they have no way of doing disaster recovery. That's uh, shockingly common, uh, but we're going to be doing better than that today because uh, we got it. All right, so I'm going to take this code off the screen. Oh, okay. Uh, take a picture of it and uh, raise your hand if you can't. Uh, and you've got you've got two people behind you who can help. Anybody? Yeah, raise your hand and call it out. And again, if you're just joining in, you're in the back. If there's tables up here that you can set your laptops on. Uh, while you're working. You don't have to come up if you don't want to, uh, but uh, it makes, makes life easier, at least for me. All right, so let me jump into the certification here. I can see the VMs have started, so that's nice. Let's go into... Ba, 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 ba. Oh, uh, there's no expiration date on the certification, so you can go back and do it over and over again. Um, I, I guess we don't plan necessarily to give you indefinite forever access, but for right now you have indefinite access. So certainly if you get it done in the next, you know, month, you know, it'll be there. If you get it done in the next six months, it'll, it'll be there. Um, all right. So let me, uh, jump in. It's actually weird to get into the course when you're an admin of it. It's like confusing. Sorry, give me just a second while you're setting that up. So the code that you saw on the screen is actually giving you access to the bundle, which includes the first one, which is GitOps Basics, and then GitOps at Scale is what Dan is going to show today. So even if you're just starting out, you can completely ignore Dan and go and do GitOps Basics on your own today or the day after tomorrow. Uh, he was, he's going to start from the middle but you get access to, to everything, so don't worry about, you know, if you want to choose another course. Okay. All right. So um, once you've uh, logged in, you've signed up, you'll see two courses that you have available. The first one is GitOps Fundamentals. Um, that one covers installing Argo, installing applications, setting up progressive delivery, blue-green deployments, Canary. Um, it covers a bunch of different really interesting patterns. Uh, and so it really serves as a foundation. And I definitely recommend you do go do that because even experienced Argo users learn quite a bit in that first course on the fundamentals um, because it is so oriented around being Git first. Um, you're going to want to navigate to GitOps at scale. And... Uh, on the left hand side, you'll see it's got like introduction and uh, about GitOps champions and there'll be a link to join the GitOps champions discord, um, which doing today is actually a good idea. We'll, monitor, we'll be monitoring that discord. Um, then it's got handling multiple applications, which we'll talk about app of apps. Um, and then it will also talk about application sets. Um, I'm going to start by presenting and discussing a little bit about um, folder management and how you should structure that. And then uh, we'll go into the exercise on environment promotion. Now, we do have um, a, full app, app, uh, a full exercise on application sets, multi-cluster management, all that stuff. Um, but I think, well, let me, let me actually ask. Um, 
I'm going to give you the choice. We can start with application sets or we can start with the uh, folder management environment promotion modeling. Um, so raise your hand if you want me to start with application sets. Raise, me, raise your hand if you want me to start with the folders environments. Okay, folders environments is, is winning. So does that mean most people have used application sets at this point? Raise your hand if you've used application sets. No, it's, about, it's about the same people who, who said uh, to start with something else. Um, if we have time, we can come back and do application sets. So I'm gonna be starting with promoting um, releases with GitOps. And uh, like I said, I'm gonna present some material and then we'll start the lab. We'll give you some time to complete the lab and then I'll also do the lab um, so you can follow along and see if there's anything you missed. Okay, so um, the first thing that you wanna know is that there are a number of different strategies for managing uh, your GitOps repositories. So when we talk about a GitOps repository, what we're talking about is um, where you store not only your Kubernetes manifests or Helm charts or customizations, but also where you store the applications and their definitions themselves. So typically, uh, you have a repo for an application where you're building a binary, right? You're making a change, it's got a Docker file, you're building an image, and then you have a repo for GitOps that is the source of truth for your applications. They should be separate repos right off the bat, okay? Now, once you've got your GitOps repo, how do you organize that? There are basically three different approaches that we've seen. The first one is an environment per branch. So each branch in the Git repository is its own environment with all of its manifests. Um, the second one that we see is an environment per folder. And when I talk about an environment, you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about like essentially a Kubernetes cluster, right? It's, or, or an Argo instance, right? Um, that you want to have watching. Um, an environment per folder means all those manifests fit into multiple folders. So you've got like data center one, data center two, East Coast, you know, maybe you name your, your environments, Frodo, you know, uh, Baggins, other Lord of the Rings characters, Gandalf. Um, and then uh, the third one that we see as it is an environment per repository. So they do create a new repo for each uh, uh, for each environment. Um, I said there were three, but uh, the fourth one, of course, is a combination of any of those. Okay. So um, the first big takeaway that I want you to have is like hella don't use environments per branch. <laughs> uh, we really recommend against this because if you think about it, you've got a branch for QA, a branch for staging, a branch for, for production, right? Now that's really simple if you have three environments and they're named QA, staging, and production. But I just said, what if you have an environment named Frodo or US West or US East or what if someone forks that repo to make changes and they have a new branch? Does that represent an environment? You don't know. And so just by looking at Git, it's actually hard to figure out what's deployed because you don't know which of those branches actually map to environments. So that's problem number one. Problem number two with this is that doing diffs is actually very difficult. Um, the, the reason the reason that diffs is difficult is because if you think about multiple environments, so if you have a, a dev uh, app, a staging app, and a production app, there are values and things that are meant to be promoted, and there are values that are not meant to be promoted, right? So it's like, oh, which database does the dev one connect to? You know, is that value saying it's connecting to the prod database? Well, I hope not, right? So you know that there's gonna be long running differences between these environments. Branches aren't set up for managing long running differences. That means that every time that you want to promote a change, you get into a get cherry pick situation. Um, I think there was a survey recently that uh, showed that like 90% of devs basically don't know how to use git. Um, they, they know how to do a commit, they know how to do a push, and then that's it. Like, like, I got a workflow, that's it. So give it, doing like git cherry pick picks or getting into like a git bisect, raise your hand if you've ever done a git bisect. Yeah, 
Yeah, so ask them for help later, everybody else. But um, that's what you get into if you're doing an environment per branch, uh, is because you need to now start thinking about get cherry picks, and then doing diffs between branches means uh, is, is more difficult too. You can't just do it off of your hard drive. You actually have to run against Git to do diffs, uh, diffing operations. So promoting is harder, uh, diffing is harder, knowing the truth is harder. So we really recommend against this approach. Um, the reason that people like to do this very often is because it grew out of application development, right? So trunk-based development is like great for working on applications. Oh, I create a feature branch. Uh, when I'm ready, I merge it. And devs kind of looked at that and they were like, you know, feature branches, those are, those are, that's kind of like an environment. Like it's like a long running thing, you know? But um, that, that doesn't really translate into the GitOps world because as a source of truth that Joe Schmo has a branch that's been alive for, for two years that is a feature that he's abandoned, you don't know what the hell's going on there, right? Um, so trunk-based development is why people have done this. It's not because they made a, a proactive decision about the right way to manage their repositories. So number one takeaway um, from this section is basically don't use environments. I mentioned all of these things. I talked about merging and that's a, that's a problem. The other issue is like, if you look at customize or Helm, um, typically you have like different values files, right? And I mentioned that now you need to have, um, you need to have these multiple values files that you're managing across these different branches. And then like, how do you do promotion? Again, it goes back to the promotion element. It's, uh, it's tricky. Um, so customize actually has kind of given us a hint here with how that tool works. So, um, let's look at using folders for environment. And this is typically what we recommend. Um, the really cool about thing about using, uh, let's see, I think I have a diagram here. Okay, so check this out. Here's an example where I have a number of environments. I've got integration GPU, integration non-GPU, low GPU, prod EU, prod US, staging Asia, whatever. If I want to run a diff between those environments, I can literally just run diff folder one, folder two, and I get the full diff between the environments dead simple, really easy. Um, and many organizations are not used to working this way. And so there is some discomfort because <clears throat> typically with Git, you're not setting up permissions based on folders, right? You're typically doing it on a repo level that exists though. You can do folder level permissions with a code owners file. Um, that's supported in Git. So you can create a code owners file and say, this team has access to this folder, this team has access to that folder, and you're done. So that, that technology exists. Most engineering teams I've seen haven't used it. Has everybody signed up for the certification? Raise your hand if you have not. Well, you have code Sorry, I didn't mean to trick you. you have the code <clears throat> you put the code okay. Um, the other thing is that promoting with this is a lot easier. So. If I have two files and if I'm using something like customize, I can have a patch called staging. Well, I'm just never going to copy that one over, right? That's easy. Um, and uh, so those elements of what's get, what moves between environments, suddenly it's down to specific files. So that makes it a lot easier. Um, also, as far as a source of truth goes, if I, if I look at my folder structure, I know exactly what's deployed. I don't even have to go to Argo. I don't have to go like, yes, I need to go to Argo to make sure stuff is syncing. Right. But I don't have to know what the, to know what the desired configuration is. I literally just have it all sitting in my grit repo already easy peasy done. Okay. So using a, an environment per folder, um, that is, that is what we recommend. And, uh, we do go into a little bit more here. Um, and it's, it's worth reading through this, but we'll get into some of it with the exercise, but like doing multiple changes at once is very easy to do this way. Cause you can copy multiple things between files, right. And different folders. Um, so that's very easy to do. Um, and then using Helm, you know, you can have your, uh, different values that you bring into your, you can have like sub sub charts, sub values and things that you bring in and copy over and separate just like you would with customize.
Okay, so that makes, that makes life a lot easier. All right, um, the third option was an environment per Git repo approach. And this is basically the same as an environment per branch, or sorry, per, uh, per folder, um, except you have moved up a level of directory structure, right? Because each, like you can copy on your machine multiple repos and you can do diffs between them. Um, and typically, the reason that people do this is because they don't know what a code owner's file is, right? It's just because they don't have that experience of doing it. Like, um, I, did a, I did a survey earlier and I was asking people like, how many of you have ever cut a release? Like actually created a release object like in GitHub, you know? And almost nobody had ever done it. Even though we're all deploying new software all the time, it's just not something that like internal organizations are used to doing. And it's the same thing with a code owner's file. Whereas in the open source world, we use code owners every day. So if it works for open source to use code owners, where like you're giving access to people that you've never even met before, um, it's gonna work for your organization. Like it's, it, it's, it's just a generally better option. Um, the only reason that you might not wanna go with something like a code owner's file is because you don't want people to have read access to something in that configuration. Um, to which I would say, what are you putting in that configuration that you don't want people to have read access to? And you're like, oh, well, I got secrets in there. And then I'll say, what? <laughs> um, don't do that, right? Uh, so typically, um, environment per Git repo is because there's some other essentially problem or best practice that's being ignored. And I'm not saying there aren't situations where that needs to take place. Um, the, somebody came up to me earlier today and I said, I like your presentation because it acted like not everybody is perfect in the world. And I was like, oh, good. Well, I need to do more of that. So um, this, there might be situations where you'd go with this option. Okay. Um, so go ahead and fire up your environment promotion exercise. And what we'll do here is uh, we're going to examine our applications and then we'll show how promotion um, would work with our different uh, Git repositories. Um, now, for this one, you do need a Git repo, and because it is GitOps, you need to fork this repository to work. Now, I'm showing you the instructions. This is what you're going to have on your screen at the same time. So uh, if you navigate to this exercise, um, you can open up this Git repo. Go ahead and make sure you fork it. Um, I actually probably already have a fork. I've, I've got it. Plenty of forks. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in this case, I'm going to go to sync fork. I don't have any new contrib contribu contributions, but you can see I'm I'm actually 14 ahead. So uh, I could go back and like revert my commits and get rid of these to, to uh, reset. Um, not a bad idea, honestly. Okay. So, da, 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 da. all right. So um, I, what we're going to cover in this one is how to deploy three different to three different environments, a QA staging and production, and how to model your environments using Git folders, and then how to promote releases from one environment to the next. And then I'll also give you a few extra bits of info. Um, so from here, uh, why don't you go ahead and let's try this, if, uh, unless there's an objection. Why don't you all go ahead and start working on this lab? Raise your hand if you get stuck. Um, we'll give you about 15 minutes to work on this lab. Um, and then I'll run through it relatively quickly and make a few comments. Uh, does that sound good? Okay. All right. So the environment that you're looking in your browser, it's uh, completely online. It's just for you. It's uh, personal. You don't not see what other students are doing. And you can experiment as much as you want. After the exercise has finished, it will be destroyed. And then if you start the exercise, another one will start brand new. Uh, but this is a real Kubernetes cluster and a real 
are goes to the instance running um, in the cloud, so don't use it for any production purposes, as all data will be lost at the end, just to make sure. And if you guys are interested in the technology we use to do that, uh, or partner instruct uh, is there, that's where the people we use to basically generate those cluster on demand and stuff. So tomorrow you can go, you, you guys are on the floor tomorrow. So go look at them and it's, it's a great technology, so we're very happy with them. Okay, um, I was gonna start running through the exercise, uh, unless people start shouting and say, please don't do that. Nobody is shouting. Okay. Um, all right, so we'll run through this. I've got my fork up and running, and uh, while you were doing the exercise, I got it all reset so I can see that it's currently up to date. Got my fork there, good to go. All right. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the Kubernetes manifests that we're gonna deploy, um, and they're under the environment promotion section. So let me just go over to those. I need to get out of me full screen, it's confusing me. Um, so if I look under the environment promotion subfolder, you can see I have a base, I have environments, and then I have variants. So let's look at the base folder. I've got a deployment, a customization, and a service. The deployment has some simple app in it. The service has a trivial Go web app service. And if I look at my customization, it's literally just bringing in these two YAML files. Um, if I look at my environments, I've got a prod, a QA, and staging. If I look at prod, I've got my deployment, my customization, my replicas. If I look at my customization, it's got a couple of different strategic merges that it's doing to update that base. Okay, so that's pretty simple. Um, I know some people haven't used customize before, so uh, the customization, you can think almost like a Helm chart, um, but it's referencing the specific manifests that need to be updated. And if we look at these um, updates, if I look at like this de deployment, for example, it's going to find a deployment that's named simple deployment, and it's going to update whatever container is named web server simple with these environmental values, right? Um, and then I've got these variants um, that are basically matching non-variants. Okay, so let's um, go ahead and start it. All right, next. Uh, the nice thing about these labs is it does kind of install and manage Argo CD for you in the later experiences, but there is an exercise you do at the very beginning to install Argo CD. So I've got to create three Argo CD applications, one for each folder one for environments prod, environment staging, one for environments QA, and these should be installed to the prod, staging, and QA namespaces respectively. These namespaces do not exist, and they need to be created either manually using create namespace or with the application, which is what I'm probably gonna do with the application. You can use any valid method to create the apps, such as the Argo CD CLI or the UI or your own custom application resource. Now, if you're doing um, earlier in the GitOps training, so if you go back and do other ex uh, exercises, it'll go through each of those and show you how to do them. Um, so if you haven't done it before. Um, and then if you're having trouble creating the Argo CD applications by yourself, be sure to look at the GitOps fundamentals course. So I, everybody said that they had created applications before. So um, I'm gonna go over and look at my environments prod, QA, staging. So I can create these applications any way I want. Now the way that I would do this in the real world, which is you know generally what the training is meant to be for, um, is I would actually create these using either an application set or a, I would more realistically, I'd probably create an app of apps and then point it at a folder and then point it at these three applications. But for, um, 
for today, I think I'll just create them in the UI to be lazy. But um, because it's more interesting than watching me like <laughs> type a bunch for application sets or something. So let's go to our, uh, go create our apps. And my first one is going to be called prod. You need to make sure you follow the naming convention because that's how it's going to check that you got it done. I can use my default uh, naming strategy. And I can use a manual sync policy in this case. Um, I'll be using auto create namespace. And I'll create the deletion finalizer. Uh, the deletion finalizer, for people that haven't used it before, is can be tricky for new users. If you set the deletion finalizer, the way that Kubernetes works is any resource you'll look, it'll always have a finalizer on it. Um, and basically, once that finalizer is released, a resource will automatically be deleted. So when you set the resource finalizer as Argo CD, if Argo CD releases that, it'll automatically be deleted. So what happens, I don't know if anybody saw the talk by Michael Goodness earlier today, but he one time had an experience where he accidentally deleted Argo CD. Does anybody know what Kubernetes does if you delete the thing that would be holding your finalizer? It deletes the thing. So he deleted Argo CD, so all of his resources automatically deleted. Ah, now you're paying attention. <laughs> yeah, it didn't seem like a big deal. So that's what this, this option does. And so a lot of people don't use the deletion finalizer. Um, it just depends on how you're using Argo CD. Now, if you're using it in a fully GitOps way, uh, I generally use this for my stuff. Um, and I know that you know, Argo CD is not going to get deleted. right? But that is a, a potential failure condition to be aware of. Um, I don't really need to set any of these other options. Auto create namespace I'm going to use. For my source repository, I'm going to use my fork. Right? So I've got my fork. And then uh, my path is going to be slash environment. I mean, I can copy it. OK, um, then local cluster, my namespace is going to be prod namespace, which is going to get created automatically. And I should be ready to go. I'm going to hit create. Let's see what happens. Because I've got manual sync turned on, I'll need to hit sync manually. For the other ones, I'm going to use um, auto sync, which is what I usually use. And we'll talk about those options. Doesn't look like I screwed anything up right now. Awesome. So it's created. OK, so now I'm going to create a new one for staging. I'll call this one staging. Default. Automatic. In this case, I'm going to use prune resources and self-heal. What does prune do? Prune means that if a resource is deleted from Git, it will automatically be deleted from the cluster. Uh, earlier today, I talked about using versioned config maps because um, config maps are like kind of poorly used by operations by most organizations because they'll update a config map and then there'll be something that breaks and they'll try to do a rollback and so the old pods will start up and bring in the new config map and it'll still be broken so you like can't roll back just by rolling back your previous pods so you have to roll back the config map too. Uh, but if you do it versioned, then it's a lot easier. So anyway, that's a whole different topic. I'm sorry for bringing it up. Um, and then self-heal means that if someone edits it live on the cluster, like if I went and did a kubectl patch or kubectl edit, or someone just pushed another change, Argo would notice that, and it would smack it out of the way and say, nope. Whatever's in Git goes, get out of the way. All right, um, I'll leave the deletion finalizer. It doesn't really matter in this case. Auto create my namespace. Uh, my same repository I've been working off of. And then my path would be uh, this staging path, right? Easy. Um, same cluster URL, same namespace, uh, just a staging, and I'll go ahead and hit create. 
Okay, so this one's going to automatically get synced. Now, I haven't actually modified anything in my repository yet, right? Um, so now I'll show you how I do this with App of Apps really quick for funsies. So uh, to do this with App of Apps, what I would do is I would go into my environment promotion section, and I would create a folder called Apps. And this is going to contain all of my references to applications. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> inside of here, I'm going to create a file called, what's the one I haven't deployed yet? I haven't deployed QA yet. So I'm going to create a file called QA.yaml. Okay. Um, and then under this QA YAML, uh, I'm going to cheat. Um, and this is a kind of an extra little tip for you. Some of this might be too simple for you. You guys are going to think, this is boring. Dan's too easy. I should have done the harder stuff. And uh, you can put on your headphones and just skip on to the next exercise and move on. Um, I'm going to set the sync policy to automatic. I'm going to do prune resources, resources self-heal. I'll leave the deletion finalizer. I'll auto-create the name. Let's, let's not do the deletion finalizer because I told you how dangerous it can be. Um, let's set up my repository URL. Make sure it's coming from my fork. And then I'm going to point it at QA and my local cluster. Um, and uh, something to be aware of with cluster, URL versus name. If you're deploying to the same cluster, always just use the URL. You don't have to worry about it. But if you have multiple environments, I would always use name. Because then I can always just change what it's pointing at to bring up a new environment, right? So in this case, it's the same cluster, so I'll just leave it as URL. But Something to be aware of. Um, all right, so namespace QA. Now you're all thinking, wait, why did you do that? Because I just wanted it to generate the YAML for me. <laughs> then I didn't have to remember how to do it from scratch, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, somebody, somebody out there is just thinking, oh, that's really nice. Yeah, it is really nice. All right, so now I got my QA in here. And uh, I can go ahead and push this. Check my git status. Get add apps. Get status. Okay, get commit. I'll sign this off. Add parent app for app of apps and QA app. Get push. Double check. Okay, so I just pushed back to, to my own version. Now, nothing's going to be deployed yet because I haven't, actually haven't created the app of apps. So I'll show you. I'll create a parent app. I'm going to do an automatic on this one. And definitely, I'm going to do prune and self-heal. So if I delete the application YAML, it'll automatically get deleted from the cluster. Um, I don't need a... I don't need to auto-create the namespace. Uh, same repository URL. Path is going to be environment promotion apps, right? That's what I created. Destination is local, but this one I need to send to Argo CD so that Argo CD will pick up the applications in there. Yeah, so I'm going to deploy to the Argo CD namespace because I'm deploying the parent app that will then pick up the application that I just created in Git and then sync that to the cluster, which will then create the next app. Makes sense? So it's an app of apps. And there's a whole exercise on app of apps. So if, this is, if you're looking at this and you're like, wait, there's like, you can do that? Um, you're going to want to definitely do that exercise. So you can see it automatically picked up this QA, right? And it's going to the QA namespace automatically. 
So, um, and then I've got my parent app here, right? And if I look at my parent app, the only resource that it's going to show is this QA app. And as soon as this QA app finishes deploying, it'll show up as in sync. And I can jump directly over to that QA app. Yeah, until a recent version of Argo CD, you could not create the apps itself in a different namespace than the one where Argo CD was installed. So yeah. we're still kind of in the habit of doing that. I think in newer version, it's not a requirement anymore. But yeah, now you can configure it and you can add additional to additional namespaces. OK, so now I should have three applications deployed, and it sees that they're all there, and it's happy with me. OK, cool. Um, now, <laughs> here's, here's a question for you. What if, so I created those two applications in my cluster, right? What if I then created them in my Git repository? What would happen? Any guesses? Nothing would happen. That's right, nothing would happen. It would automatically just take over management. They already exist in Kubernetes. So this is, this is true as well of existing Kubernetes resources. If you have, and some people will say, hey, I've got some resources that are not under management of Argo CD. How do I get them under management of Argo CD? Literally just create an app that points at them. And as long as the source of truth is the same as what's deployed, literally nothing will change except that now they're under management, right? So you can just migrate stuff over. It'll add an annotation. That's what it will do. It'll add an annotation to let, let you know that, let Argo know that, that it's happening. All right, so each of these is using a different selection of manifests, all managed by customized overlays. And so we're gonna promote releases by copying fi files between the folders uh, that hold the overlays. Okay, so if you look at the manifest located in each folder, each application is defined by the following files version.yaml that defines the container image, settings.yaml that defines the application level setting for the application. Uh, so those are all just variables, right? Replicas.yaml that defines the number of replicas, and service.yaml that, that uh, points to each application. All these files are managed via customized and are defined according to the promotion scenario of your organization. In our example, we will mostly deal with the first two files. You can do a different split depending on your needs. For example, in our case, we can move settings between different environments by copying the settings.yaml file uh, while we have different replicas per environment. We, can also ha we have also included two customized modules, the prod one for the production and the non-prod one that is used for both QA and staging environments. Viewing the applications, we have created three separate tabs. So you can see these, these three tabs, QA tab, starting staging tab, and production tab. And you can see that staging currently has version three uh, uh, sorry, QA has version 3, staging has version 2, and production has version 1. So now we can actually do a promotion by just updating these, just copying them, right? Now if I'm using this structure, so if I go back and look in here, um, I can do, let's go into these, uh, let's go into the ends here folder. And if I wanted to do a, a diff between prod and QA, I can literally just run that diff right here and it will show me all the differences in these files, right? And so what I'm gonna see is I've got things like my service node port that I don't wanna promote, but then I've got things like um, my values and stuff. And I'm, this isn't a very pretty diff view, but you can do this with an IDE, right? So I'll give you the same thing, just to show you how it works. Okay. Um, so the way that we do our updates is we just copy file, right? And we, we make sure that the files are representative of what's supposed to get updated. So if I'm going to update, um, and you can actually label these too. Like you could create an overlay called staging. And it's like, I never update the staging one in production. If that gets copied over, I made a mistake, you know? Um, and you can automate it, right? Uh, but let's go ahead and promote the current application version from staging to production by literally just copying these two files. Okay, so um, let's look at my, let's just do this in the UI. And I'm going to look at my environments. And I'm going from staging to prod. And I'm looking at the version.yaml. So I'm going to go to my version YAML. Um, and I could run this right by doing like a, a cp command or i can go to prod and version and paste right and you can see the only thing that's changing is the version number 
And let's go ahead and commit that. Prod to v2. Oh, I need to add it. Obviously. Okay, I'll push that. Um, and this is going to automatically get picked up. Uh, now, I think my prod I had set up on a manual sync, right? If I go to edit my application, you'll see I can no longer get a preview of the manifest by doing that. I have to actually go to the manifest here, click edit directly, and then uh, that's how I would copy my application over to, to move it back into management. But let's go ahead and just sync it. All right, so now it's picked up the change. It's going to spin up those new pods, and I've done it. I've, uh, I've done my promotion from one environment to the next. Easy peasy. Go ahead and check that. Um, and of course, we can automate this using CI. Now, uh, in the example, we do this with GitHub Actions. Um, you could do this with CodeFresh CI as well. Um, I don't know if I should go through and set this up during this. I think we should move to the next section. But let me, let's just do a poll. <clears throat> Raise your hand if you want me to demonstrate setting up the workflow. Like one person. Okay. Raise your hand if you'd prefer that I just move on to the next section. That's most people. Okay. Uh, the eyes have it. So here, um, the these sections where it shows, uh, there's just there's. I mean, I'll just show you very quickly. Um, if I look at uh, GitHub Actions here, you can see I've got a promote application uh, action workflow that runs, and. Um, Basically, all this does, and it, it'll, they exist under the GitHub Actions Workflows folder. Basically, all this does is copy information from files. So if I look at like, da, 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 da. so here it's running like a copy file action between two files. It's not doing anything fancy. You don't have to do YQ. You know, if you're, if you're structuring stuff in the files this way, you don't have to get into those more complex operations. You're literally just copying files. Um, and that can just be automated, right? So that's, that's nice and easy. Okay, so um, that gives you the baseline of like copying the files, showing you how that structure works, and showing you how a promotion would happen. And we can look at our production app, and we can see it's now using uh, staging. So let's go into the next section. Um, okay, so let's let's talk for a minute about image updater. Dan, yeah. before you start, make them start the next lab so they won't have to wait for the Yeah, go ahead and, and go to the live exercise Argo image updater and hit launch and uh, I'll talk at you briefly while it's launching. Okay, so now we've shown uh, how that folder structure works. And I know it's like so simple. It's like, hey, man, you're just showing me like how to organize a folder. And it's like, yeah, that's all I'm showing you. That's how simple that is. But when you do that right, you literally, you literally avoid so many complex problems that come from using uh, like branches for environments. Um, just organize like good hygiene on your, your config files makes your life a lot easier. And before I even talk about image updater, um, I want to mention a tool called Argo CD Autopilot. Uh, I know I'm asking you to raise your hand a lot. How many people have heard of Argo CD Autopilot? Wow. Oh my gosh. OK. So check this out. Here's, here's several things we didn't talk about. Remember when I created that parent app and I created it in the UI? Well, now that parent app isn't in Git, right? So if my cluster went down right now and I wanted to get back to where I was, what, who is paying attention? What would be deployed if I just deployed what's in my Git repo? Does anybody remember? It would deploy my parent app and what? And QA and nothing else, right? Because all the other stuff I just created in the UI. Okay, now, Think about your Argo CD instances that you have in your organization. How many, of you, how many of those apps were created in the UI? 
Okay, are you starting to get a sense of the problem? Right? So if I needed to bootstrap this, it wouldn't come back. So what Argo CD Autopilot does, this is a tool that uh, we developed for Argo, and it's a command line tool, and it has the most remarkable command. So you add a git token, you add a repo, and you run Argo CD Autopilot repo bootstrap. And what it does is it installs Argo CD, and it sets up an application set that will, and uh, app of apps, that will make it automatically self-managing. So Argo CD is under self-management, and it automatically knows what folders to look at. And once you run this command, you literally never have to touch the Argo CD UI at all. Everything else is Git. So um, I use this for my, I have a home lab cluster. I've got like a three node, well, it's like five nodes. I've got like a five node home lab cluster that I run everything off of. And I came in one day and something had like broken on the cluster. I think it was like I had let uh, K3S not be updated for too long or not restart for too long. So like the certificates expired. So it was like it crashed. So I had to rebootstrap the cluster. I literally ran Argo CD autopilot, repo bootstrap dash dash recover, rebootstrapped Argo CD, rebootstrapped all my applications. I was back up in like two minutes. Like it was so fast. Um, and I have like stateful workloads and stuff. I mean, it's like, uh, if you can't do that, if you can't, if you can't delete your, your stuff and then just run rebootstrap, then like this, you definitely should finish the whole certification and then start implementing it. Right. So, oh yeah, 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 totally. I totally view it as disaster recovery, but it's an, it's an, it's an ops problem, right? But like, if you solve your ops problem, you also solve your disaster recovery problem. Now, you do have to think about stateful stuff and like how that gets rebootstrapped. And so you need to have like a solution for that. And uh, Kostas gave, gave a great talk today about um, updating databases with GitOps that would be very applicable to that kind of setup, right? So definitely check out Argo CD Autopilot. Uh, go star this repo and, um, and try it out. But I'll show you like, my home lab cluster, um, you can see I've got, it created my bootstrap projects and user, and then under projects, uh, it has a application set that generates everything for that project, which is pointing at a specific cluster, which is just the local one. Um, and then I created an apps folder for my parent apps, right? And then I just have, um, if I wanna add stuff specific, you know, then I do that that way, right? If I, I can just add it directly in Git. Okay, so image updater um, is solving a different problem. What image updater allows us to do is monitor, how many people have used image updater? Okay, so this is new for most of you, good. All right, so image updater is a really cool tool. We have, within Argo, we have a whole section of tools that are called Argo Project Labs. They're technically not CNCF projects, they're just community projects and anybody can make them if you wanna build one at some point, you know, and, and add something to Argo Project Labs, you know, just get in contact and we'll, we can help set you up to do that. But um, image updater started as that and what it can do is it will monitor an image registry for tags and you can set this by Semver, you can set it by specific, you know, patterns or whatever. And then it will automatically update your Git repo with the new tag. So if you're just promoting new images, image updater like takes the headache out, right? It's very easy because you're just saying, hey, when a new image gets tagged for staging, automatically deploy it to staging, right? Um, but it's versioned and, and it can handle all that. So image updater is very powerful and nice to use. Um, and, uh, so the way that the way that um, the way that image updater works is it has by default it will just update the workload in Argo. So it'll just specify a new manifest for Argo CD to deploy. Uh, so if I don't have anything in Git, uh, and then it has an option that's called Git Write Back, and Git Write Back will actually update Git. So you have to enable that as an additional option. So let's go through and and do that lab. Um, there's not really more for me to explain off of that. Yeah, that's good. So let's do this. We've got, 
we don't have a ton of time. We've got till, we've got about 15 minutes. So go ahead and fire up the live exercise if you haven't already done it. Um, and let's do this exercise. And then uh, we'll have one other tool we'll introduce before the end. That's not good. Um, and then raise your hand if you didn't get an Argo Tumblr. Oh, it's like most of you. So uh, maybe we should do, Laurent, let's just open the box by the door so as people go out, they can grab a tumbler. We've got uh, more than enough for this room, so we should be good. Yeah, just take one. Yeah, yeah. So actually, let's, let's do this. So um, as you start working on that, I'll, I just want to introduce kind of like the final like two little topics um, to be aware of. So after you finish this, the next uh, uh, labs are on sync hooks, sync windows. Um, and, uh, and then of course, if you haven't done the app of apps or the application sets earlier, then you should do those exercises. And then you can take the test and you'll be level two certified. Uh, the level one, if it looks too simple, just go do the test. But it'll show you how to do progressive delivery and things like that. Now, um, with the, if you think about this problem of like updating manifests and updating these resources, doing it with a CI pipeline works. Image updater is going to cover binaries for us, right? Just images. Um, and probably like a good, I don't know, 60% of the time, all you're updating your images. So for handling things that are out of phase from just updating images, there is a, a million dollar question, which is like, how do you update the configuration as well? How do you do it across environments? And when I say it's a million dollar question, uh, CodeFresh is betting that it's more like a $500 million question. Um, we announced this week a new tool a new feature for modeling environment promotion that allows you to model not just images but also configuration and you can also model specific lines of configuration that go through promotion so you can do like staging to production promotion and it knows which sections are supposed to be promoted and which ones aren't supposed to be promoted so we're not going to demo that today but definitely stop by the CodeFresh booth. We can give you a demo of it and show you how that works. There's a really cool spec that goes into it. I don't want to spoil any surprises, but AI is part of the story because that's fun. Like you have, you have to have AI. You know, nobody's going to care if you don't, but AI is part of the story. Um, modeling environments across multiple Argo instances, multiple clusters, that's part of the story. So definitely check that out. Um, that's the final word on it. And then uh, I think what we'll do is we'll let you work on the um, image updater lab. If you have any questions, we're here to help answer those. And then it just thumbs up, like recommend so far so good. Or, or did you feel like, hey, that wasn't enough time. Like I need six hours to do this, which is true. Yeah, thumbs up. People are feeling good. And then you'll be able to work on this on your own. Um, you can do the entire rest of the course and the level one and the level two. And of course, level three um, is in production. So that'll be out later.